Bill Dorman, who is the president of the Friends of the Library for a few remarks. Good afternoon and welcome to the first presentation of a new series of events sponsored by the Friends of the Sacramento State Library. My name is Bill Dorman, I'm president of the Friends. For a decade or more, we've offered a author lecture series and now we're pleased to inaugurate a second set of presentations we call the Town and Gown series. And the purpose is to, of this series is to share with the campus and the wider community the talents and expertise of some of the university's faculty members who have, we think, something of timely interest to share. It's only our second Zoom presentation, so bear with us if there are any glitches. We have a wonderful professional staff standing by to solve them if they do occur. Before I introduce our topic today, I wanna to remind you that uh, audience members will be receiving some membership materials from us. We hope you will consider them and consider joining the Friends of the Library. Now to today's panel. I suppose there are any number of hermits who have taken refuge in caves somewhere from this refused century, uh, confused century and are blissfully, blissfully unaware of the lecture, uh, I mean, excuse me, of the coming Tuesday election. Uh, many pundits have described it as the most important election in our lifetime. Uh, none of the people that are on joining us today, of course, are disinterested, and we're certainly welcome, uh, welcoming you to this panel. Uh, it's an all-star Sacramento State panel. It's organized by Kim Nalder, a professor of political science who also serves as the executive director of the university's nonpartisan project for an informed electorate. Now, in full disclosure, Kim is a former colleague of mine, and I mention it only because I think it gives me leave on basis of firsthand experience to describe her as nothing short of outstanding. And I'll leave it to Kim to introduce her equally impressive panel, Kim Nalder. Okay, um, I will introduce the other panelists, I guess, as we get closer to it. I didn't have that up. I, I actually thought, Bill, you were going to do that part, <laughs> um, but I do have their, their um, bios that I'll, I'll bring up. But um, we have several other faculty members from political science and a new faculty member, Andrea Terry from um, communications, who's just joining us this, um, this fall. So it's kind of exciting. So let me go ahead and start and then I'll do the introductions before we get to the next people. Um, so first of all, thank you so much to the friends and to the staff for putting this on in the first place. Um, it's timely, of course, to talk about what's going on with the election. And, um, you know, we're excited to sort of present this panel and think through some of these issues with you in the Q&A as well. Uh, I wanted to put in a little bit of a plug for the um, some some things that the Project for an Informed Electorate has on our website. So if you just Google Project for an Informed Electorate, I know it's kind of a lot, but uh, you'll see that we have initiative explainer videos. So we do an initiative explainer with the legislative analyst's office, uh, analysts, the people who actually write our official voter guide, describing the initiatives. Then we provide information about endorsements and about campaign expenditures. And those videos are around five minutes each. And this year we have them also with ASL interpretation and with Spanish subtitles, if you so desire. So if you could spread the word about those, there's you know just this one week left, but let's get make that happen, right? Um, so today I want to talk about disinformation in particular. And if I have time, I'd also like to talk about democratic legitimacy and minority rule. So disinformation, is, is sort of a subset of misinformation. It's when people perceive something to be true that's false. Disinformation in particular is when that is done purposely, right? So, so if you think about the you know, Russian interference in our election where they create fake news. <clears throat> so the, what's especially problematic this year about the disinformation that's out there is that much of it is about the election itself. So we have disinformation about voter fraud, about mail-in voting, um, and, and those things can undermine, undermine confidence in the election itself and potentially depress turnout or 
um, make people concerned about the outcome of the election too and suspects after the election. So, you know, we get concerned about the post-election period as well. This disinformation is hard for us to deal with for so many reasons. Um, one is that we are dealing with malevolent foreign governments, right, who are trying to influence our elections, trying to undermine our confidence in our democracy. And they've gotten better at it since 2016. Now there are deep fake videos where you can manipulate a video to look at it as if someone is saying something they actually didn't say, that's scary. Um, they're using text messages now to text people with false stories. And when you get a text message, you're more likely to sort of believe it because usually you just get texts from people you know and trust. And another reason that they're, it's really difficult to deal with disinformation is that lies, we tur it turns out that lies travel further from the truth than the truth. Um, we know from studying 2016 that false stories got shared far more often than true stories and that those false stories, especially on say Twitter, they had longer tails. So they were um, forwarded and commented on and so forth for longer over time than the true stories were. So, so that's especially dangerous because it can overtake the actual factual information. Another reason it's really tough to deal with disinformation is, is because we have this tradition of free speech, not just tradition, it's actually in the constitution, right? And so any attempts to rein it in with regulations or uh, policies can be problematic because we assume that political speech uh, can be, you know, is free and protected, uh, even if it's uh, damaging or negative or, or even, you know, dangerous in some cases. Another really particular problem this year is that not only do we have the disinformation coming out from foreign sources uh, and other malevolent forces, but the actual president of the United States is engaging in this disinformation. He's the biggest spreader of the disinformation about the election security. And that's obviously problematic because he's incredibly visible. And he's also someone who his followers implicitly trust. And so they're unlikely to reject information that, that he puts forward, even if it's false, like this idea that the election uh, by mail is somehow not uh, valid or is uh, you know, more subject to fraud than other sorts of voting. None of that is true. And then the other problem with disinformation is that just we as human beings have a lot of cognitive biases. And sometimes we like to think like, you know, I don't have those. It's other people who have those cognitive biases. But it turns out that our brains are just wired in such a way that we somehow sometimes think in ways that are not logical or consistent or you know sensible. Um, and one of the biggest ones that's relevant here is the illusion of truth. So we have this idea that things are true if we've heard it a lot of times. So it feels true, right? So if you've heard a concept a lot of times, you start to believe it's true even if it's not. And if you think about the social media environment, you may get the same story forwarded from all sorts of different people and you start to believe it's true, especially if it's on also in media sources that you go to that are outside of social media. So that's a big problem with disinformation that the repetition actually makes people believe that it's true. And then there's this thing called motivated reasoning, which is that we have a tendency to want a particular outcome or, or particular to come to a particular conclusion. And so we'll psychologically accept information that supports that conclusion and reject information that counters that conclusion. And so that can make it really tough to dig out disinformation from people's minds once it's in there. And then there's uh, the false consensus effect. So we have this tendency to believe that since we believe something and many people around us also believe it, our friends and our neighbors and our you know, Facebook friends or whatever, that it must be the case that almost everyone in the country believes that. And I'm sure most of us have experienced that around politics where you know, you're sort of surprised by election outcomes sometimes because it just seems like everyone agrees with you, but it's just everyone you know, everyone in your bubble that agrees with you. And so that can lead to people, um, you know, if you're getting information, for example, um, from President Trump saying that he's way ahead in the polls and you believe that and you think that everyone else believes that, you're likely to think that the election was rigged if it turns out that Joe Biden gets more votes in reality. You won't believe it, right? So there are 
um, social scientists know that there are certain patterns to who is more likely to be vulnerable to disinformation. Um, one is just people who are in a strict media bubble. So they're not perceiving information and they're not receiving information from a variety of sources and from a variety of um, points of view. They're just getting it from you know, a limited uh, range of ideology. And in many cases that can be flawed. And so you won't, you won't know it if you don't expose yourself to additional information. Uh, another thing we know is that political extremists are more likely to uh, take in disinformation and that's true on the left and the right. So people who are very highly partisan and highly polarized are more likely to believe this disinformation, especially of course, if it benefits their worldview. More patterns are that um, less educated people are more subject to conspiracy theories and disinformation. People who don't use analytical thinking as often, who are less open-minded and who are lower in this thing called science curiosity. So science curiosity is this, you know, when people who just want to solve a puzzle and want to understand how things work, if you're high in science curiosity, you uh, seek out truth and evidence and facts. If you're low in science curiosity, that's really not something that you engage in. And so you're more subject to, to believing disinformation. Also, if you think in a more intuitive way, you're more subject. So um, people that sort of go on feeling and intuition are more likely to buy into misinformation. People who believe in simple solutions to complex problems are more likely to be subject. Um, you know, if you think about a lot of the, the disinformation, it, it comes across as really simplistic, like obviously this is the case. Uh, without getting into the complexity of the reality of the world. And then for conspiracy theories in particular, um, people who attribute agency and intentionality where it doesn't actually exist. So, you know, you're on a hike and you trip over a rock and you think like that rock <laughs> tried to trip me up. That's so rude. Uh, if you're, if you think that way, you're more likely to take in that disinformation. And then there are a lot of emotional reasons that people are subject to it as well. Um, people who are high in anxiety, uh, if you're feeling a lot of uncertainty, and if you're feeling a lack of control. And if you think about those three things, uh, COVID activates all of them, right? Lots of us are feeling incredibly anxious, uncertain, and feeling like we don't have control right now. So it's especially a rough time for people, um, you know, warding off misinformation and disinformation. And then there are also some social aspects to it. So people who perceive hostile outgroups um, conspiring against your in-group are more likely to perceive misinformation. And if you think about that in, in terms of politics, it's this idea of you know party identification as part of our tribal identity. And if that's the case, and we believe that there's um, you know hostility from the other party, we're we're more subject and vulnerable. And it's it's especially bad if we have this thing called collective narcissism. That, that sounds really bad, right? But it's when you believe that your group is superior and the other group is inferior, maybe even morally inferior. And you know, if you think if you apply that to the political parties, you certainly see a lot of that in the press and a lot of that in you know political discussions where we're seeing this kind of demonization of the other party going on. So what does all this this you know social, emotional, cognitive stuff map onto in our political world? Well, we're, we're more vulnerable if we have, you know, really strong party identifications. So people who are, who are very invested in politics and those are the people who vote, right? Um, if you have more perception of threat from the other party and people who are very active in politics are more likely to feel that way. Uh, if you buy into the demonization of um, the other party that is, uh, you know, spread through some media channels, right? If you, if you watch cable news, for example, you're going to see some portrayal of the other party as not just you know coming from a different point of view in terms of policy, but you know being bad or evil or, or wrong or something like that. Um, so um, one thing that people you know sometimes shy away from, but that the social science really does um, find is that conservatism is especially associated with many of these things we've just mentioned. Uh, we see, for example, more. Um, sharing of fake news on social media that is of the conservative bent. Um, and that, that is true more of conservatives, but it's also true 
in general of people on the extremes, but, but it's, it's lopsided. Um, so what we have is a bunch of people who are primed to believe that the election is rigged, primed to believe that you know, maybe their candidate was actually ahead, but the other party's out to get them, and who aren't trusting of information that may be factual coming from legitimate press sources. So that's not a great, a great recipe for uh, a smooth election coming up. So if we think about, you know, what, what can we do to kind of address that? What, we can, what can we do to fight all of this? Um, well, you know, we see some social media companies starting to do a little bit. They, I mean, they've been very late to the game, but they're, you know, requiring that you read an article before you forward it, or they're limiting uh, campaign advertising. They could do a lot more. Um, Facebook is one of the worst purveyors, well, not purveyors, but um, spreaders of disinformation. Um, they alone could do an awful lot to limit its spread. Um, if, if organizations, if media and so forth point out that you may be misled by some arguments, that can just prime us to think uh, we may be being fooled. Um, and then just education, we're seeing more of that happening. I feel a little bit hopeful about this. We see media literacy taught in high schools more than ever. Uh, we see these sorts of things addressed in college classes as well and in the public. We see more fact checking by media organizations and more just awareness of this problem of disinformation and the need to address it. So I wanted to talk about minority rule, but I will do that in the Q&A because it looks like I need to pass it on to my colleague, Danielle uh, Martin who is uh, an assistant professor of political science. And um, I need to find my, my notes on everyone. Shoot. Um, so let me just tell you about Danielle and then, then I will find that document before we do the next people. Um, so Danielle is an assistant, or excuse me, associate. She got promoted. That's so awful. She's an associate professor of political science. And she's, she's been amazing in our department, a great addition. She has lots of uh, interesting research in political behavior and elections out. And she's a fantastic teacher as well. So I, I'm sorry I didn't give you the proper introduction, Danielle, but please take it away. No, thank you so much, Kim. Uh, no problem. Um, and thanks to the Friends of the Library uh, for hosting this panel. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, the polls. So since 2016, we've heard a lot of people saying things like we can't trust the polls and the polls are always wrong. But these generalizations don't really tell the whole story because the national po polls got it right in 2016. So I'm gonna start with briefly reconsidering the 2016 polls, and then I'll explain why I think the 2020 polls are different this year. In 2016, the national polls did correctly predict that Hillary Clinton would win the national popular vote. And most reputable polling firms did accurately predict that final national vote percentage within a few percentage points. The issue is that the national popular vote, yeah, that corresponds to national polls, but it doesn't determine who wins the presidency. And this is really the crux of two potential issues with polling in 2016, a lack of emphasis on the electoral college and not enough high quality state polls. So first, most state polls were not as reliable or ac as accurate as national polls in 2016. And there were many fewer state polls, even in competitive swing states. So in 2016, we just relied too much on the national polls and not enough on state specific polls in those competitive swing states. And we, and I'll say that in terms of a collective we, um, the media, pundits, academics, voters, we forgot our basic civics knowledge that it's the electoral college, not the national popular vote winner that determines who is uh, the presidency. So the national polls did accurately predict the popular vote, uh, but because we didn't have those high quality state polls, we didn't have good prediction of, of who, predictions of who's gonna win those swing states. So the polls we should be paying more attention to then, it, if we wanna try and predict who's actually going to win the presidency are the state polls in those competitive swing states. So the good news is that we've learned a lot from 2016. So comparing 2016 to 2020, there's some important differences uh, that I think are worth highlighting. So first, there's been a lot more specific 
more of a specific focus on polling in competitive swing states. And so we can have much more confidence in the polls accurately reflecting the electoral college vote because we have much more and much better information from polling in swing states. So in 2020, we just are, there's less reliance on the national polls to predict those state outcomes. And generally we're all just much more conscious of the electoral college and that it's the electoral college, not the popular vote that, that determines the winner. Getting a little bit more wonky though, uh, pollsters in 2020 are better at accounting for respondents level of education as well. So in 2016, the polls didn't properly account for the differences between non-college white voters who turned out heavily for President Trump and college educated white voters. That gap between those who are college educated and those who are not college educated has been growing. So now in 2020, pollsters are weighting those non-college white voters to more accurately represent their turnout numbers. But aside from polling techniques, there are some other reasons we can be more confident in the polls uh, in 2020. First, there's a lot more early voting and mail-in voting. So nationally, voters have cast about 50% of the total votes that were counted in the 2016 election. So any late breaking news or events are less likely to have an impact on the election because so many millions have already voted. There's also many fewer undecided voters in 2020 than in 2016. And we can get into reasons why later, why there's so many few undecided, fewer undecided voters. But regardless, there's just fewer people to persuade or try to convince to turn out to vote um, in 2020. So again, uh, combining those two points, it's just unlikely that we're gonna have any so-called October surprise at this point that's going to change people's minds and make the electoral outcome vastly different than what we're seeing in the polls if for no other reason than so many people have already voted and so many have already made up their minds. So it's not likely we'll have something similar to a Comey letter like we did in 2016. Even more generally, the polls have been much less volatile in 2020 than in 2016. And again, that's potentially related to my two previous points as well. There's fewer undecided voters than in 2020 than in 2016. Um, but Clinton, her lead in the polls throughout uh, the election se season fluctuated much more based on news events or campaign events. And in contrast, Biden, he's had a consistent polling lead, but it's and it's held remarkably steady for weeks or even months now. The campaign events that typically have uh, caused changes in the polls, such as uh, debates, they just haven't had the same kind of effect that they historically have had. Generally speaking, if a uh, candidate is five to six percentage points uh, in the lead, that means that the electoral college likely is gonna track that popular vote. But if there's a closer margin, then it'll become much more likely that national polls won't predict that electoral college vote. So in 2016, Hillary Clinton's lead around this same time, just about a week before the election, uh, was only 2.9%. So in contrast, the average of the polls over the last week or so has Biden with around a seven to eight percent lead over President Trump. That's according to Real Clear Politics, but you'll see that on 538, for example, and other uh, pollsters. So assuming that the national polls are correct, it's more likely this year that the Electoral College result is going to be uh, the same as the popular vote. So generally, how do you evaluate polls? I've told you you can trust you know, the 2020 national polls and state polls at least more so than you potentially could in 2016, but we're inundated with polling information all the time. And there's a lot more polls about the hundreds of other races and ballot propositions that voters decide on. Uh, so how can you decide whether you should trust a poll or not? Uh, so here's just a few things that you potentially should look at. So look at the sample. A larger sample does not necessarily mean a better or a more accurate poll, but it will help you put the margin of error in context. So a smaller sample does mean a larger margin of error. That's the plus or minus number that you'll see reported along with polling results. And that will mean that a poll could show candidates basically tied if you take that margin of error into consideration. So that would be one to maybe, you know, take a second, second look at before you decide whether you're going to hang your hat on those uh, particular results. You also wanna take a look at the sample in terms of whether it's representative of the population it's trying to say something about. And if not, it needs to be weighted. Uh, so that goes back to uh, what I talked about earlier with, with waiting for um, education, for example. You also wanna look at how participants were recruited and how the questions were asked. So does the sample include landline and cell phone participants or is it an online poll? Were the questions asked in multiple languages, for example? 
And finally, you also want to take a look at the question wording. So were the questions biased or leading things along those lines. And regardless, you always want to keep in mind that polls are based on probabilities, they're based on statistics. So they're only going to tell you about a snapshot in time when that poll was taken. And we all have to recognize there is uncertainty in those polls. And we need to start getting a little more comfortable with that kind of uncertainty and having a better understanding of what that uncertainty actually means. In terms of the polling related to elections and the horse race in particular, these pollsters have a particularly difficult task, not only of predicting public opinion or support for particular candidates, but also of predicting who's actually going to turn out to vote. So they're not only trying to predict how someone's going to vote, but even if they're going to vote or not. So finally, I wanna wrap up uh, just why should you care about polling? Um, and maybe I should have started with this, but why do the polls even matter? Uh, they matter for turnout. So theoretically, if someone sees that their candidate is way ahead in the polls, they may not think that they need to turn out to vote because their favorite candidate will win anyways. Or if voters think the election isn't competitive and one candidate is gonna win in a landslide or not, and they're seeing that in the polls, then they might not turn out to vote because they don't think that their vote is gonna matter anyway. This is something that Democrats in particular have been worried about in 2020 lately. So they're worried that since the polls show that Biden is winning by a fairly comfortable margin, that Democratic voters are gonna relax and stay home. Conversely, Republicans are also trying to use these same polls to show, hey, Trump is behind um, in the polls, so we have to make sure to rally our voters to get them to the polls and also trying to paint him as an underdog um, in the race. So it's possible that these kinds, if you see these kinds of polls, that it's going to affect turnout either positively or negatively. This year, especially with really high turnout numbers that are projected and already having really high levels of turnout in terms of early voting and mail-in voting, it's possible that the polls may not impact voter turnout in the same way that they have in the past, uh, but it certainly is still possible that these polls and the, and the media coverage around the polls will affect uh, turnout. So even if you don't care much about the polls or whether you're, I've convinced you can trust them this year or not, um, I do think the polls can have an impact on elections and that we can uh, trust the polls in 2020, at least so, more so than uh, in 2016. So with that, I think I'll turn back over to you, Kim, for introductions. Yes, and I will do it properly this time. So it's a good thing that, uh, that we got a warning ahead of time that we might have some bumps on this one. So sure enough, I'm delivering. Uh, so the next panelist is Christina Flores Victor. And she's an assistant professor in the political science department here at Sac State. She currently researches and teaches in the fields of California politics, Latinx politics and immigration. Recent projects have included the examination of discrimination in the Latinx community in the United States and experiences of English language learners in higher education. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christina. Thank you, Kim. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me here today. It's really nice to be here. Um, I am going to talk to you about the Latinx vote in the 2020 election. And I want to touch on four items today. The first will be polling. So I'm going to talk um, more specifically about polling the potential Latinx electorate, you know, would be voters. Uh, second, I want to talk about political issues that matter on a national scale to potential Latinx voters. Uh, third, I want to talk about swing states where the Latinx vote could matter or be pivotal um, for determining who wins the election. And then I'm going to lastly, I'm going to talk to you about the gender gap. So differences between Latinas and Latinos in preferences um, in the national election. So as I mentioned, uh, the first item is going to be about Latinx polling results. Um, as Danielle mentioned already too, the quality of the polling um, of certain groups has really increased in the last um, several years. So increased substantially. We have more bilingual polls, we have more bilingual polling firms. And why this matters or why this helps is it helps us get a more representative sample. So previously when we didn't have bilingual polls and polling firms and when we would call, if the person answering the phone only spoke Spanish, we might have to hang up and then try and call back and get that person later on. And there's a lot of drop off when we do that. So now with uh, more bilingual polling firms, we're able to just go ahead and continue with the call and we get a more representative sample of the Latinx population. 
Um, also, we have more polls happening in more states. So as Danielle mentioned, higher quality polling in more states, right? And especially in competitive states. This also helps us get a more representative sample of a very diverse Latinx electorate. So no longer are we seeing polls that were only kind of just English speaking Mexican Americans or English speaking Cuban Americans with uh, samples coming from California, Texas and Florida. Now we have samples coming from across the United States and we're um, sampling Spanish speaking um, Latinx electorate. So this helps us to have a more representative um, poll of what Latinx voters wants. And in general, polling of the polling is done of Latinx registered voters and done by firms like Latino Decisions. Um, these, these polls are commissioned by groups like the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, uh, Univision, Unidos US. And so there are lots of people out there now paying for these high quality polls, <clears throat> excuse me, which allows us to have a more kind of accurate idea of what's going on with the Latino electorate. So a couple of things to kind of get us started is the Latino electorate right now in recent polls is showing that we have highly motivated potential voters. So approximately 70% of the Latino electorate are saying that they are very motivated to turn out to vote. And around 80% are reporting that they have a plan to vote and are planning to vote. And about half report that they are going to be early voters or that they have already voted in this election. So these are um, really high numbers compared to previous uh, presidential elections for the Latinx electorate. Now, the second item I wanna to talk to you about today is what issues or policies matter to Latinx voters at the national level? So here we have some new things to talk about. By far, the number one issue for Latinx voters in all of these polls is COVID and the response to COVID. Um, half of those polled said that they had a friend or family member who has been diagnosed with COVID. One third of those polled said they knew someone who had died from COVID. Um, there is greater trust in experts and in Democrats than in President Trump on the issue of COVID. And interestingly, one poll was actually in the field before President Trump announced his COVID diagnosis. So half of the people had been polled before he said he had been diagnosed and half of the people were polled after he was diagnosed. And you could actually see the shift in preferences toward Biden after he was diagnosed with COVID. So COVID is a really important issue for the Latinx electorate. And among the Latinx electorate, President Trump's disapproval rating for the handling of COVID is around 70%. So there is concern that we reopened too soon and that we ignored early warnings about COVID. The second issue that matters a lot to Latinx voters is employment, specifically improving wages and creating more jobs. Latinos, since we just talked about COVID, are increasingly dealing with um, increasing unemployment, increasing housing security, decreasing income and decreased savings. So they're very worried about the employment issue. Third issue that they care about is healthcare and more specifically, the cost of healthcare. With COVID, people are very concerned about healthcare. I wanna say in Texas, Georgia, and Florida, these are states that all have districts that have very high numbers of uninsured Latinx children. Some districts in Texas have as high as 33% of all Latinx children are uninsured. So healthcare and the cost of healthcare is tied into the COVID issue, is tied into the ACA, and people are worried about the cost of healthcare. Um, another thing that rates pretty high is schools and education. And again, this, this issue is also tied to COVID. Um, people who are polled are worried about school reopenings. They're worried about children, family members, parents, teachers getting sick. And at the same time, they're very worried that distance learning has been difficult and they are not equipped to handle um, teaching remote instruction at home. Immigration, this is something that is a holdover from previous um, presidential elections. Immigration is always kind of in the top set of issues that Latinx electorate cares about and specifically fear of deportation or knowing someone that's been deported, a family member or a friend and the future of DACA. And one last one that is a new one this year 
um, that we haven't seen quite this high in the preferences is a concern about discrimination against Latinos and immigrants and a concern about addressing racism. So unfortunately for President Trump on this particular issue, there is less trust that President Trump will be able to kind of bring the country back together. And that's one of the, the question wordings that Danielle was talking about. They ask, you know, who do you think is gonna be better at bringing the country back together? And there's less trust that Trump is going to be the one to be able to do that. Now, I do wanna kind of just make a little special note here that um, Cubans, Cuban Americans who are polled, for them, foreign policy is in their top five. For the rest of the different types of Latinos, foreign policy doesn't kind of crack that top five, but for Cuban Americans, it does. Um, the third issue I told you I wanted to talk to you about a little bit was on what states are going to be, what states will the Latinx vote be pivotal? So we have a lot of states that are, the Latinx vote could be very important. Uh, we have the usual kind of lineup, Texas, Arizona, and Florida. They're gonna be very, um, those are interesting states to watch because they have a very high number of potential eligible voters. So Texas, 30% of their electorate, of their eligible um, voters are Latinx. In Arizona, 24% of their eligible voters are Latinx. And in Florida, 20% of eligible voters are Latinx. Now it used to be in Florida that there were more Cubans um, in the Latinx electorate. And now Cuban and Puerto Rican population has kind of leveled out. So this is another reason why Florida is a really interesting state to watch. But we also wanna watch Nevada, which has 20% of their electorate um, is, of their eligible voters is Latinx. But other states that have kind of been really important to watch this year have been North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Ohio. Now, even though these states, the, the proportion of the Latinx electorate um, is only like 2.7 to 5.3% of the state's electorate, these states have been relatively close in the, in the, the polls. So if there may be 10, 20,000 votes separating Biden and Trump, and you know, two to 5% of your electorate is Latinx electorate, this is where states where the Latinx vote could be pivotal. And in some of these states, well, what does the polling look like? Well, in Texas right now, the most recent poll that just got dropped like an hour ago, so it's piping hot and fresh, 66% uh, prefer Biden to 25% Trump in Texas. In Pennsylvania, another state that is being watched by everyone, 67% in favor of Biden and 25% in favor of Trump. So we really kind of want to watch these swing states. One thing I want to note here too is that um, the Latino electorate is tends to be younger and the younger Latino electorate does have stronger preferences for um, Biden over um, President Trump. So the last issue I want to kind of touch on that I think is really interesting about the Latinx electorate is the gender gap between Latinas and Latinos. So just so that I'm totally clear, President Trump, he never polls above 50% with men or women, and the closest he gets is around 47% with Latino men in Florida. So that's the highest that he kind of taps out at with the Latinx electorate. But we have a gender gap in these states that I just talked about. So the largest gender gap is in North Carolina, one of the states that people are watching right now. The gender gap and the preferences between Biden and Trump is 21 point difference in their preferences. So Latina women prefer Biden by 21 um, points more than men. In Texas, there's a 17 point difference. And in Arizona, there's a 15 point difference. And one of the things that's very interesting about this gender gap is that it's not just a gender gap. It's also a rural gender gap. So where we see the biggest differences between men and women are men and women who live in rural areas with women in rural areas favoring Biden by 70 to 75%. And in some of these cases, it's more than a 20 point um, difference. Now, one kind of word of caution when we interpret these results is that Latina turnout of registered voters seems to lag behind other groups of women. So white women or black women, it tends to be about 10 points lower than turnout for these other groups. 
So while turnout in general has kind of increased over recent presidential elections, there still is this gap between kind of the number of eligible voters we have and then the number of voters who register and vote. And so people are looking at this election to say, maybe this is the, this is the time when we kind of start to close that gap between uh, Latina voters and other types of women voters. And um, I'll wrap up with saying like, why? Why are we seeing this gender gap? What might be some of the things driving the differences? Um, well, as Danielle kind of mentioned already too, um, education matters. And right now there is an increase in the number of college educated Latinas. So some people speculate that this could be driving some of that gender gap. And when women are polled, Latinas are polled, there is a really strong preference for women's autonomy on reproductive rights. And so these could be two of the things that are starting to kind of drive that gender gap between Latinas and Latinos, at least at the national level. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Kim to introduce uh, Andrea. Thank you. So uh, Andrea Terry, our last panelist, is an assistant professor of rhetoric at Sacramento State. She earned her PhD from Texas A&M in rhetoric and public affairs. Her work investigates the intersection of faith and politics in the United States and has been published in the Journal of Communication and Religion, Journal of Communication Inquiry, the Journal of Religion, Media and Digital Culture and a number of edited volumes, which is incredibly impressive for a brand new professor. Uh, that, that's who we are hiring these days, it's amazing. Um, she's currently researching the rhetoric of spiritual advisors in the American presidency. So welcome to Andrea. Hello, and thank you so much for having me. I am just going to get my slides fired up because I love slides. So as Kim mentioned, um, I study the intersection of religion and politics in the United States. And one of the things that I have been thinking a lot about in this election is what's going on with the relationship between religion and the government, because there seems to be a really something slightly different going on throughout this election cycle. And so as I was kind of investigating this, one of the things that I went back to was some work by Phil Gorski, who is a sociologist. And what he says is that there are basically three different strands or theories of the relationship between religion and the government in the United States. The first is liberal secularism, which completely issues any connection between church and state and wants them kept apart both in our discourse and practically speaking. The second is religious nationalism, which I'll talk about in just a moment. And the third is civil religion, which relies on two different concepts, covenant theology and civic republicanism. And I'm sure you're wondering, why are you giving me a primer on these things? Well, because I see the two main candidates having very different approaches to the relationship between religion and the government. And as a rhetorician, the things that I study are both the things that presidents say or presidential candidates say, and then the images of those candidates as they perform their, their campaign and their promises for what kind of president they would be. And so what I have found as I've been researching this is that if you look at Donald Trump, he relies more on an idea of religious nationalism. Gorski says that religious nationalism relies on the organic fusion of religious and political communities where the government encouragedly or actively encourages some form of religious belief and where churches preach uncritical patriotism. Christianity is prioritized in the US with this form of religious nationalism. Now, one of the things that I wanna point out here is that while Trump himself doesn't, has historically not performed any kind of religious perspective since running for the presidency in 2016, he has courted evangelicals extensively. And one of the things that he has done is he has performed aspects of conservative evangelicalism very publicly in a way that signals to conservative evangelicals that he is one of them and that he will actively fight for them. And so when we think about some of the things that have happened 
throughout Trump's presidency, and then specifically in the run-up to this election this year, we have a number of symbolic performances he's engaged in that signal to conservative evangelical voters that he prioritizes them. For example, the image that you see right now um, is the photo op in front of St. John's Church during the George Floyd protests. Um, we also have different things that he has said that signals this to conservative evangelicals. So for example, in January, he gave a speech where he said things like, I really believe that God is on our side when speaking to a group of conservative evangelicals. He also described the United States as, quote, not built by religion-hating socialists, but by church-going, God-worshipping, freedom-loving patriots. So you can see there that the fusion of patriotism and religion is complete in that sentence. He also um, has argued before that during the same speech that, quote, a society without religion cannot prosper, a nation without faith cannot endure, because justice, goodness, and peace cannot prevail without the glory of Almighty God. He's also extended this theme to his own election. Um, we've seen lots of images of him having hands laid on him during different moments in his presidency, um, which is something that is specific to a particular branch of evangelical Christianity. And he has also said that he believes in his rallies that we are going to win another monumental victory for faith, family, God, country, flag, and freedom. When talking about religion in his campaign, he specifically speaks to Christianity being under attack and has also used conspiracy theories in order to connect more with the apocalyptic element of right-wing evangelicalism in order to make this election seem even more serious in terms of needing people to vote for him. So he infuses the election with a sense of urgency for evangelicals and he unites um, religion and nationalism or patriotism in his discourse and in his public performances and the kinds of photo ops that he has that makes it seem as though uh, Trump's priority is toward a specific branch of religion in the U.S., that being conservative evangelical Christians. So that's one version of how religion has played out in this election. Another that we can look at is we can look at what Joe Biden has performed in terms of his religion. And what I found when I was looking through Biden's speeches and I looked for images that had been taken of Biden um, during this election cycle that had to do with his approach to the campaign. And what I found is that Biden tends to rely on a position that, is, that falls within American civil religion that we would call civic republicanism. So within civic republicanism, there's a focus on the common good, things like liberty, virtue, and balance. There is a clear interconnection of individual freedom and civic participation. And civic republicanism tends to be a bit more, I don't want to be say secularized, but it has a broader net that can be cast. So it includes more people, whereas religious nationalism typically um, appeals to one specific subset of the population. Civic republicanism is trying to capture everybody. And one of the things I found when I was looking for images of Biden in ways that he performed his religion is that there were two kinds of images that I would see. There were images of him performing his faith individually by himself, or there were images of him interacting with folks of other faith traditions. So what we see here is that um, Biden's campaign is being pretty intentional about showing that his faith is something that he engages in in private, but that he supports the the choice of others to engage in their religious traditions. 
So for Biden, we see him talking about how faith is individual and it's separate from politics, but can also inform our morality. So for example, in one of his campaign ads, he said, faith is all about hope and purpose and strength. And then he also said, my private beliefs relative to how I would deal with church doctrine is different than my imposing that doctrine on every other person in the world, equally decent Christians and Jews and Muslims and Buddhists. His campaign has also talked a lot about extending protections for all different kinds of faiths. And he has been talk, um, he's put out some different statements on anti-Semitism and anti-Muslim actions. So when Biden characterizes this campaign, he focuses on this notion of making justice accessible across religious perspectives, but also having religion as something that you perform in private. Um, so one of, I have more I can say on Biden, but I know that time is getting short. So I just wanna wrap up um, by reinforcing. So this is the choice, one of the choices that I think is important to think about when making sense of this election is that there are two competing views of the relationship between religion and the government from the two candidates. We have Biden's civic republicanism and we have Trump's religious nationalism. And so it's important to think about what the end result of either of those would be and which vision we wish to see for our nation moving forward. Thank you. All right, so I think we'll go ahead and get all the panelists here together and um, ask just a couple of questions. We've had a number of questions submitted. I don't know if we're gonna be able to get through all of them. <laughs> Let me just get everybody here with us on camera. Here we go. All right, so we had one question submitted. What does the research say about um, people who might be lying to the pollsters? Oh, I'm gonna take that one. Um, so it, it's related to social desirability basis or bias, excuse me. Um, and we know that participants, generally speaking, they want to please the pollsters, right? They want to only say things that they know are gonna be socially acceptable. And pollsters do try to account for that in the way that they ask certain questions and even in the mode of the survey. So whether it's in person or over the phone or, or online. Um, the question though seems to be a little bit more related to um, in 2016, there were a lot of stories about shy Trump voters and perhaps they were purposely trying to mislead the polls or embarrassed to say that they were voting for Trump. And I think that um, it, it's really hard to say because there's little evidence on whether there has uh, been those or whether there were those shy Trump voters because it would be difficult to pull, right? If they're too shy to say that they're going to or that they were supporting Trump, well, they probably also wouldn't wanna tell you that they were purposely misleading or embarrassed of their vote choice. So it's a really difficult question to get at. And especially any sort of question of, you know, are you purposely trying to mislead the polls? Obviously no one would answer that honestly, if they were trying to mislead the polls. Um, so it's really difficult to get at uh, the, that, uh, an answer to that question. I did though, over the summer see um, some polling trying to get around that question of whether you um, trust the polls uh, to keep your responses anonymous or whether you um, trust you know, how the media is going to interpret polling results, things along those lines. And Republicans did, they were less likely to trust the polls or less li likely to trust um, the media. But I don't think that, that that's necessarily widespread. Those are still really small percentages um, of respondents. And so I don't think that it greatly affects the polls or it should be something we should be worried about is skewing the polls currently. Um, but a general distrust of, of the media or of pollsters or worrying that your responses aren't gonna be kept anonymous. I mean, that's the part of a, a more general um, problem that, that is a little bit more worrisome. If I could add just one little thing. Um, when it's um, around election time and people are really engaged in the election, they want to express their support for their candidate. 
And so there's, you know, that, that really reduces the propensity for people to you know, strategically uh, give the wrong answer in order to mislead the pollsters. That's really unlikely. I'll just add in one thing too. I mean, people are always allowed to say that they're undecided. And so this was addressed in one of the Latinx polls is that there were a larger number of Latino voters who were undecided until more recently. So I think for a lot of people who may be the, the shy Trump voter would just say that they hadn't decided yet, right? It's an easy out to say like, oh, I'm not sure, I'm still thinking about it, and then to break for Trump. So I think some of that is probably captured in undecided and not, they're not actually in a pool where they're not supposed to be. All right, I'm gonna sneak in one more question before we wrap up because I think it's a good one. Um, is how do you all as experts in this area, what sort of information do you find reliable? What sites, what source, how do you, how do you get reliable information? Well, there, there are a lot of good sources for information. I think, you know, we've become so cynical about misinformation and my presentation probably didn't help with that, but, but mainstream uh, organizations ABC, NBC, CBS News, for example, uh, national newspapers are good sources of information. They have journalists who are very committed to the ethics of journalism and will provide multiple sources and will actually retract and correct information if they get it wrong. Uh, where, where we start to run into problems is uh, you know, new online outlets, cable news can be less reliable that way. Um, but there, are, and there are also a lot of online organizations that are that are great for um, pro projecting the polls. You know, like Five Thirty Eight that was already mentioned. Other people want to comment on that. I like to make sure that I just have a good cross section. So um, if we think about, there's some different maps out there that plot different media sources in terms of um, their truthfulness and their kind of ideological bent, if you will. And so one of the things that I did um, both on my social media and personally is I just make sure that I have a good cross section of all of the different types of sources out there. So for example, I have BBC, I have um, the New York Times, I have the Washington Post, I have Politico, I have the National Review, I have a whole bunch of different things out there. So when something is happening that's significant, I can see just at a glance right away how different places are reporting that one issue to see in what areas they align and in what areas they diverge. And that not that kind of gets me out of my own bubble too. So I'll add in one quick thing too, and I think Danielle mentioned it, I just want to emphasize it. If it's polls that you're dealing with, then I would possibly look at um, the source of the poll, who commissioned the poll, when it was done, how many people are in their sample, what's their margin of error. Um, some will actually give you information, especially if you're thinking about the Latinx population or other populations, whether it was done in language or not, whether it was done online with cell phones, with landlines. Um, I know that that's a lot of kind of research that you have to do, but a lot of polls when they're released will kind of put that information either at the very top or kind of like at the bottom that'll describe their methodology. And once you kind of have a trusted source that you can go to and you understand how they do their polling, I think that that can be uh, really useful too. And two things on that note, if they're providing that information, if they're transparent about it, then it's more likely that you can trust it. So it's the polling when they aren't transparent about their methods or their questions or who their sample was, that's when you need to be a little more wary. And we've already mentioned 538, but they also do a whole ranking of pollsters. And so you can just Google 538 pollster rankings and they grade them on an easy A plus to F basis. And they have a whole, whole uh, host of uh, variables they put in there to decide if they're trustworthy or not. But it's a good quick reference as well. And one more thing, um, the American Association of Public Opinion Researchers has a transparency initiative. And so you can actually look on their website and see which organizations are participants in that. And there are a lot of standards that have to be adhered to. Our polling organization at Sacramento State called Cal Speaks, we are a member of that. And it's, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of hoops that we need to go through to make sure that we meet that certification, but that does guarantee that you're getting good information.
All right, thank you so much. It's a couple of minutes past two o'clock. And so I want to be respectful of, of uh, your time and thank you so much for joining us. I will um, go ahead and just quickly turn it over to Bill Dorman for some closing remarks, um, but thank you again. Uh, while I was teaching uh, at Sacramento State for some 40 years, uh, I attended a number of national conferences on political issues of this sort and listened to a number of panels. I don't remember a single panel that informed as well and as clearly as this one. Uh, and I thank you so much for your input. Uh, each one of you contributed an original deep dive into electoral politics that uh, I think anybody that's interested in this election will gain from. Thank you so much. And I hope that the rest of you, I uh, got something from this of value. Uh, I hope you'll also uh, look forward to future events by the presented by the Friends of the Library. We will keep you informed about those. Thank you again and good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.